Um, this is then Ali Sloper's cavalry. Uh, Ali Sloper was a cartoon character of before the First World War. Uh, he was a scrounger. He wore a very, very grey crushed top hat. Uh, he'd obviously get very down at heel. Very, very good at stealing. Very, very good at drinking heavily. Uh, and you might remember uh, a certain uh, W.C. Fields actually copied him for his stage and um, screen act. That was the same person. Um, but the Army Service Corps was created basically to supply the services for the British Army before the Great War. And what we're going to be talking today about is particularly the, the role of the horse. Now, anybody that's seen War Horse the film will be aware that Michael Morpurgo can write some very, very good novels. What he is, is less good at history. Um, also, of course, if anything is going to involve animals, it is going to be a tearjerker, whatever happens. I will be honest and say I, I own dogs, um, I've worked with, with horses. Um, I would like to sort of set the record straight on the role of horses in the war, particularly in the fate of many of them. Um, and I'm going to start by saying that some of you may well have read the Anasul uh, novel Black Beauty. Black Beauty is about a horse that is horribly abused and, and later on has a much better life. Um, it was done to highlight the plight of horses before the First World War. Um, during the war, 11% of horses died in the course of the conflict. During the course of the conflict, 11.8% of soldiers died. In other words, horses had as much chance of dying as men did, because we have a Royal Army Medical or Royal Army Veterinary Corps. And very importantly, it actually in peacetime, roughly 15% of horses died in England during that period. In other words, if a horse actually goes into the army, it's got a less chance of dying than it did in civilian life. Why? Because we need to keep them alive. They're a valuable asset. Um, People at home did abuse and, and, and still do animals. But let's, let's look at this in a bit more detail. This was actually put together when I was the director of the Royal Logistic Corps Museum, uh, as I mentioned, which is why I left it up there. Um, this really is then the building blocks of transport. But I need to make it very, very clear. That three ton lorry here is superb, absolutely brilliant at carrying weight compared to a two-horse team behind on the general service wagon. Um, what is the problem with the three-ton lorry? Why is it we actually have so many horses compared to so few lorries? And that, that could be because actually um, the generals were all um, cavalry and they loved horses and they hated motor transport. That's what you'd be told. Uh, if you actually look at the um, list of generals and where they came from, Far more are engineers and infantry than cavalry. Um, Haig is not a cavalryman. But there we are. Uh, the fact is that people believe it. And the main problem is this. I'm, I'm going to just give you one word. The word is jeep. Jeep. 1941, we get the jeep. And 1941, we start a process of doing away with horses. Why? Because until 1941, there is nothing with better off-road ability than a horse or a mule. Because that thing there is great. You drive it off that metal's road, it will sink to its axles and never move again. It really is as simple as that. So when you perhaps pick up a book, and some of you might have read the book by A.J.P. Taylor, he will point out that between 1914 and 1918, the British Army, read Canadian if you like, sends by weight more forage, that's roughage for horses, yeah, than ammunition by weight. And let's think about it, the volume taken up by a 4.5 inch shell compared to even compressed forage, a bale, you know, is quite considerable. Uh, and he'll say that this proves that the generals were stupid. Well, actually, throughout the war, cavalry represents 2% of horses, <coughs> 2%. By 1918, Haig is complaining he does not have enough cavalry. The cavalry have been sent off to Palestine, where they do a very, very good job. So just to get us started, 
We need horses. We cannot fight the war without horses. We can supply up to basically railhead forward. Beyond that, we need them. And by the way, one of the great problems that we get is after a successful action, and it was mentioned earlier on, if the enemy withdraw, and they withdraw over this area that's been fought over with barbed wire and trenches and all the rest of it, until you've built new railways or roads, nothing can get forward. A little while ago, I actually did a war game with officers of the Army Service Corps. Some of them we made generals responsible for the advance on the 1st of July. Others were logisticians running all the logistics and laying out the railways. And when we did the game, I think must have been just after lunch, the news came through that our big offensive had failed. And all the infantry officers, the cavalry officers went, oh, that's a shame. All the logisticians said, thank God for that. Because if the enemy are pushed back, we can't supply an advance. And that was mentioned earlier on. But let's just quickly go backwards before we go forwards. This then is the Crimean War. The British forces and the Crimean War. 1854 to 1856. Many of you will be aware it was a logistical disaster. Well, Jack, here's good news from home. We're to have a medal. That's very kind. Maybe one of these days we'll have a coat to stick it on. This is punch. Why does this happen? And everybody will always say the same thing. It's the army. It's the army. It's the army. Until 1833, the British army had the Royal Wagon Train. Developed in the Napoleonic Wars, it meant we did not have to hire horses or wagons in the theatre of operation. Instead, we took it all with us. We had people who were dedicated to resupply. That's what they did. That's what horses, wagons, carts, whatever we need, it was there. Until 1833. What's special about 1833? Well, basically, there are no wars going on of any size. And the Treasury, bless him, decided what we don't need anymore is a royal wagon train. We'll do away with it. And when we go have a war, what we'll do is, like the old days, will hire the wagons and the horses and the teamsters locally, which I suppose might make sense unless you go to war against Russia in Ukraine. Does this sound familiar? Because what they have a habit of doing is what's called scorched earth. They don't generally hang around with teams of horses and wagons to say, hello, do you want to hire them locally? That's not going to happen. And wherefore, when we go to war in 1854 in the Crimea, basically the whole thing collapses very, very quickly. Army's response as follows. One, when it came to cooking, massive shortage of fuel. We bring in Alexis Sawyer, chef at the Reform Club, who had previously thought up a system of mass feeding during the potato famine in Ireland. So he was known. He was a celebrity chef. I mean, we think they're modern. Well, they weren't. The Victorians had them too. Alexis saw a Frenchman, by the way. He went out to the Crimea, looked at it and said, what we need to do is develop a stove, big drum with a chimney, very efficient, cook for 50 people, very little fuel. British Army, thank you very much. We'll make them. That's done. Next thing, they bring out people from Britain who are building the new system of transport in the UK. It's called the railway. And they turn up and say, what do you want? Well, we need to supply from Balaclava Harbour, which, by the way, is currently being attacked by the Ukrainians, up to the heights <coughs> overlooking Sevastopol, because we're besieging Sevastopol. Don't things change over time? <laughs> anyway, the key thing is that they build the railway. They said the way they build it, but they want no help from the army, because the army don't know what they're doing. They build it. They build it, first of all, with stationary engines, later on with mobile engines. And by the winter of 1855, we are doing superb job with minimum, minimum problems. The French army who started off with loads and loads of horses find that with no food, they die. And they actually ask us, could you, excuse me, monsieur, could you build us a railway? And we do. And we give them their own railway. And everyone's very, very happy. It's the first railway ever used in military history. And then the war ends in 1856. And that sets really en route what we're going to get in the future. And it is worth saying that here in Canada, start building a railway. USA, start building a railway. 
Britain starts building a railway, Germany starts building the railways, and you th would have thought they would build it with basically trade in mind, they don't. They build it with deployment in mind. Their railways largely go east-west, either side of Germany, so either they can fight a war in the west, or they can fight a war in the east, or as they attempted to do in 1914, knock France out, then turn east and fight the Russians. By the way, uh, the theory in 1914 was the Russians would be slow to mobilise. Just going to give you that in a moment. Uh, Russians slow to mobilise. But what we're talking about now actually is this. We're talking about the sinews of war. For what we have received and are going to receive, here's to the ASC. Now, throughout the war, people make fun of the Army Service Corps. They call them the Jam Bandits. They give them all sorts of names. There are songs about the ASC. They say, you know, if anything's missing, it's been stolen by the ASC. But without them, none of this would have been possible. And the Army Service Corps, like so much, is going to be the unsung heroes of the conflict. And let's remind us where we are. What we're talking about now is the original plan of the Germans, the Schlieffen plan. Now, for those that don't know, Schlieffen is dead by the time that this operation is carried out. And Schlieffen has said the sleeve of the most right-hand man of that great wheeling action should get wet in the Straits of Dover. They actually reduce it in size because they are very worried about what might happen in the East. And there is a theory that the Schlieffen plan was developed to demonstrate to actually the German Imperial General Staff, we need more soldiers, not fewer. And they don't do it. They actually say, oh no, let's, re let's put some more in the East just in case it goes wrong. And you'll be aware that this great wheeling action does not work. And I probably mentioned this here before, we get trench warfare in 1914. Not because I spot you and you've got machine gun and I've got machine gun or you've got flat range, long trajectory artillery or whatever. It's because actually the Germans have failed to capture Paris. They've captured all of industrial northern France. They've captured five eighths of, of seven eighths actually of Belgium. They can win the war by staying where they are. And, and then what we need to do collectively is to mount offensives to push the enemy back. The Germans can win the war by staying where they are. Do that again? We have to mount <coughs> offensives to put them back. The Germans can win the war by actually staying where they are. You're going to go, ah, yeah, but, but what about then Verdun? Why do they do that? Well, the answer is Falkenheim decides in 1916 that if he can kill enough French, they will ask for an armistice. Oh. The armistice word, yeah? They wanted actually it to happen. Now, if you're British or Canadian or Australian or New Zealand, if you've committed your armies to Europe and then the French ask for an armistice, what the hell has everybody died for? This is one reason why, wait for it, we mount the Somme offensive. Very importantly, ultimately, the Russians in the East collapse and that's why the Germans are able to mount the Kaiserslacht in 1918. But believe me, throughout most of the war, it is a defensive war. And in many ways, that does help, a little bit like our REMC, because with a static front, it is relatively easy to do resupply. But to give you an idea of the size of the BEF, at the beginning of the war, we are an incredibly small army. We have 120,000 men and 40,000 animals. The Belgian army is basically 300,000 men. French army, 1.7 million. German army, 2 million. We turn up with a fraction. But look at where we are in 1918. With basically 3 million men at half a million. So that way I can include horses, mules, donkeys, or anything else you can think of. I mean, that's the numbers we're talking about. Uh, and clearly, when it comes to resupply, sorry, I've got to go backwards, one, then we're talking about things like this one. This is the standard ration biscuit being issued to soldiers coming into the trench, in this case, in 1918. How does all of this get here? Well, the answer is, all over the empire, it arrives by ship. 
And this is Rouen. We have a ship being unloaded, in this case, directly onto railroad cars. And that food would be everything from jam coming from South Africa through to frozen meat coming, in this case, from Australia. Uh, this, I think, is frozen mutton. There would also be frozen rabbit. Uh, and the idea was basically all of this lot arrived directly through ports like Rouen. It came in through Calais. It came in through uh, Dunkirk and Boulogne. It, all of those were actually part of that great chain supplying the army directly. Uh, and the problem you've then got is how you actually then regulate that, particularly when it comes to the amount. Now, this is a ziggurat of supplies inside a, a barn. Uh, this lot actually at the dock at Calais. And all of this is rations or forage or stuff like basically linseed oil ne necessary for horses, <coughs> but also for wooden equipment. And just the amount we've got here is absolutely staggering. Let's think about it. The population of modern Birmingham in the UK is around 3 million people, okay? Now imagine taking 3 million people, Birmingham, and dropping them down in northern France for four and a half years and supplying them on a regular basis. Nobody that I'm aware of starves to death. There are some shortages, but not permanently. They are always temporary. In 1914, a soldier was receiving one pound of meat per man per day, one pound of um, basically vegetables, one pound of bread. In fact, during the war, they actually reduced the amount of meat that soldiers get. Everyone says, oh, that's because of unrestricted submarine warfare in 1917. The reduction in the meat ration is 1915, two years earlier. So someone was guessing what was going to happen. Or actually, the problem was detected <coughs> by the REMC. Too much protein means basically bunged up stomachs and problems with boils. But imagine this. Imagine working in a field bakery. This is bread proving before it's issued to soldiers. Now, bearing in mind, bread is not a front-line issue. It's biscuit. That's a hell of a lot of bread. And that will be repeated up and down the line before it is issued forward. And here we've actually got food being lo loaded into, in this case, steam lorries before it goes off to the railhead. And what then happens at the railhead, it is picked up and sent forward. In this case, obviously, we're transporting howitzers without their barrels on their way to be used. But it gives you an idea that that relationship between the ship coming in, storage, or immediate issue as it goes out. And at the port of Richborough, very near where I live, the old Roman fort still exists. Below that was the first ever roll-on, roll-off ferry. The trains actually drove directly onto the, the ferries and then they went straight to the continent to unload. And we're actually in a situation where the British are supplying locos and rolling stock. And just out of interest, in 1916, the whole system is creaking, particularly rail transport. So what happens is General Haig, that well-known technophobe, yeah, says what's going wrong. He's told that basically the army are doing their best. They have a whole training scheme for railway operation. We have our RODS railway operating divisions, but actually they're not very good at it. So what he does is he speaks to a man called Geddes, who was actually in command of the entire railway network in Belgium and France. He said, well, yes, but I'm a you know, manager. Well, not anymore. You're now a major general. Well, what about my you know, inferior officer? Well, sorry, my, my, my subordinates. What happens to them? Would you be happy if they became brigadiers? The army is absolutely incensed by this, and he establishes his own, basically, control hub for the railways, which becomes known as Gettysville, because it's actually a town in itself. 
but they now very, very accurately or successfully operate the railways. And this is what we're talking about. Now, I already mentioned the problem we've got with horses and the problems with lorries. Here we have standard gauge railway coming in, the trains come in, it's been unloaded. Now, start thinking about this. By 1917, it is very, very, very clear there was one big shortage in the British Army, Canadian Army. It is not ammunition. That has now been sold. That will be sold, really, by the time of the Somme. But, actually, the problem is that we don't have enough men. So we get the creation of the Labour Corps. The pioneers did that previously. We also then get the establishment in 1916 of the Chinese Labour Corps. 90,000 Chinese from Shandong province. The, the French do the same thing, largely from French Indochina. Where's that? That's Vietnam. It, it, it is worth saying that um, uh, the commander of the later Viet Cong was, at the end of his service, was in fact Ho Chi Minh, was a chef at the Versailles Treaty. How about that? Um, the key thing now is that what they're going to do is they're going to load these lorries. Now, what's always interests me, looking at these pictures, is these guys here are loading the lorries. Now, we talk about unionised labour, okay? Now, there aren't many people to load the lorries, but every lorry has a driver sat in place. Does he have to be in there with a lorry park? The answer is no, but basically, loading isn't my job. Not their job, they don't do it. They load onto those, this then will be taken forward to be done. And you can see the size of the ammunition dump that we're talking about. This is then using a rather different system. This actually is the use of horses. Here, two trains have arrived at once at the railhead or control station. And what we now have is horse-drawn vehicles that have come forward. Now, one of the great, great innovations of the Great War is arguably, I suppose, better aircraft, we've mentioned that, uh, better machine guns, better artillery, better aircraft. How about the compressed forage machine, otherwise known as the baling machine? They do not exist in 1914. Forage went forward loose. Once you've got the baling machine, it's all much, much easier. And the thing about horses, when you think about it, is that horses are very, very good at pulling the wagons that we need on an uneven surface. But the problem with the horses is that those horses need the stuff that's actually on the back of the wagon every single day. The great advantage of a motor vehicle is you turn it off, you walk away from it, you come back a week later. It's still there, yeah? You tie up Flossie and Dobbin and walk away for a week, you come back to two corpses. <laughs> and that's something you've got to bear in mind. You, there is no steady state when it comes to horses. You need them all the time. And these guys here are the drivers of the Army Service Corps. Huh? Canadian Army Service Corps too. The key thing to bear in mind is here is that that driver there is earning twice what an infantryman would be earning. And when you go into the estaminet, the end of a week in the trenches, you walk in and at the bar there are two drivers of the Army Service Corps who basically can swank around with their bottle of red wine or white wine, otherwise known as plonk. That's the beginning of the fight that will break out about nine o'clock. <laughs> because they see them as, as we know, um, in the terms of the Americans in the Second World War, they, they are known as Renf. Um, if you know, you know. I'm not going to explain it. Um, the key thing is that this then is just the gigantic amount of materials required. Now, there are two materials here, one of which you're already familiar with. One of which is compressed forage for horses, yeah? The other one is what's loaded in that flat wagon there. And you can see some of it's spilt out. What the hell is that? That's actually road metal. In other words, it's compressed aggregate to be used to build, one, roads, two, the base of railways, three, 
dumps for ammunition and for rations. Because early in the war, lots and lots of this material was lost. People basically cordoned off a field, put it in there, and when it rained, they watched it sink and disappear. What you need to do then is have your dumps with everything basically better stored than this. This, by the way, is a, a very good photograph of ammunition taken in 1916. Uh, by 1917, by the way, these dumps were being targeted on a regular basis by German night bombers who were looking for them. And uh, by 1917, these things were destroyed at a rate of about one a month. It made not the slightest difference to the war effort. We had far more ammunition than we needed. Because, basically, we could produce it. Uh, largely, by the way, because my grandma was doing long shifts. <laughs> the key thing, then, is this. And this is, basically, sorting out everything. There is no point loading a wagon to send it forward if you're going to be sending forward rations. Fill the whole thing up with corned beef. Great. Not a problem. What do you do when you get to your destination? How do you disperse it? What you have to do is actually have a control station where they can organize the rations into the correct proportions. So you're thinking about biscuit, you're thinking about jam, you're thinking about bacon, you're thinking about cheese, you're thinking about rice, you're thinking about oatmeal. All of that goes in correct proportions. Then it goes forward to basically where it's then broken down into sandbag loads. Each sandbag, by the way, being enough food for six men for one day. That's the way it goes up. And just so you know, by the way, with loose material, sugar goes in one corner of the sandbag, coffee or tea goes in the other, everything else goes on top. And all being well, it is wrapped in greaseproof paper. Otherwise, on a hot day, it produces a somewhat hairy mess. And then this shows the real problem of trench warfare, and that is success. Because this is a GS wagon loaded with a bit of a mixed load of tools and supplies. But here we have one horse, there's another one there, there's another horse, there's another one there, there's another one, another one there, there's that one and that one. That is actually eight horses to move what normally would be moved by four horses across broken terrain. And God only knows what happens if you then find a trench across the front of you, or indeed run, bump into barbed wire. The guns. Now, we already know that the guns are very, 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 very uh, consuming of ammunition. During the preliminary bombardment of the Somme, about one and a half million shells fired. By the way, uh, about 30% of them never went off. So perhaps my grandma wasn't as good as I thought. <laughs> uh, but the key thing is that this is how you supply forward batteries of the Royal Field Artillery. Eight 18 pounders for each side of our mule. And here we've got our Army Service Corps driver, or probably actually a driver of the Royal Field Artillery, going forward from an ammunition dump to the front. Um, this means that we can maintain our bombardment. You already know, if you put your three ton lorry on that, that's the end of it. Now, in terms of the Army Service Corps, one of the things that you might not expect is, how about this? Buses. Around 600 buses are operating at any one time. And it could well be that that guy there, there's the bus driver, actually was called up in 1914. He was a, a driver for the London Omnibus Company. He would report, actually, to Devonport, uh, where he would be told, this is your bus, you're taking it to France, while you're on the ship, you need to paint it khaki and knock the windows out. And he would then operate that for the rest of the war. That's what you do. So a lot of people, soldiers, say it was a little bit like living in London or Liverpool or Birmingham, uh, where you're actually you're commuting on a regular basis. You're delivered to just behind the lines by bus. And when you finish your five days on the line, you come out by bus to take you away. Um, by the way, two things. Um, in London, just so you know, um, well, let's go. on the Western Front, you could never have more than 12 men upstairs because with the weight of equipment, the bus falls over. And when you were on leave back in the UK, if you were, I don't know, can someone give me a, a Canadian Highland Regiment, please? 48th. 48th, okay. You're a member of the 48th. You come to London on your leave. You're there for 10 days. 
when you're in London, anyone know what you're forbidden from doing? Is it something about kilts, breezes, and top decks? Yeah. You can't go up the top of a bus. <laughs> Because everyone gets a look. There we are. Okay. The important thing is that then we've got this. Uh, and this is pretty typical. Canadian work. Cordero Road, yeah, as used very commonly, getting forward supplies. Those guys there looking very, very happy because they don't have to march. And very, very importantly, we've got this. We've actually got our rolling cookers pulled by four horses. These things were incredible. They actually were developed before the Great War. They have then a piece just here, which actually is a system for hot water. They then have five cooking containers. There's one on the floor there. These soldiers come out the line. You can see tinned food. We've got then three of them. Fourth one here. This is a full battalion's load of cookers. There's one cooker per battalion ever see those again that's what you're looking at and by the way these containers have a, a lid on them they can be taken forward hot or you can put them in a large crate lined with hay becomes a hay box and the food will continue to cook ironically and some of you might know this these things were abandoned in the 30s we do away with them because they're no longer regarded as being capable of being pulled by motor vehicles as we reduced the number of horses. The Germans are very much more sensible. What they do is they go, OK, we're not going to use horses. What we're going to do is put them on a flatbed lorry and still be able to cook on the march. We can still move with them, which is what they do. Now, for those that don't know, this is a group of British soldiers in 1917. Now, somehow we've got it into our heads that soldiers in the Great War are all very young. Just out of interest, can't see much detail there, a bit more detail there, quite a lot of detail there. Oh, look at that, he must be a teenager. <laughs> but they're all quartermasters. What they're actually doing is dividing up rations into the correct proportions including tinned material, in this case bread, quite rare, putting it into sandbags ready to be taken forward. Actually, I think they're cheating and they're actually using um, rope handled uh, buckets, canvas buckets, to get that food forward. And these guys here, simply waiting, pick up the food, take it forward and deliver it. One sandbag for six men every single day of the war. And here, the result of that is our situation with guys, God knows what they're cooking, but they are simply sat in a trench cooking. Now, if I was to make a program about the Great War, which concentrated on the different ways of cooking rissoles or something, people would tell me, I really don't know what I'm talking about. However, down here, we've got one of the most useful liquids, and that is marked SRD, which means sell the service ration depot, actually in Deptford in London. In there, you would find commonly what? Rum. Rum. Or, wait for it, lime juice, or if you're incredibly unlucky, whale oil. So if you stole one of those with your <laughs> mates, get well and truly hammered on a Friday night, you'd be really upset to discover you've just stolen two gallons of lime juice. Even more upset to discover you've just stolen two gallons of whale oil. But this gives you an idea of the expansion. This is where we are in 1914. They see 6,431 men feeding about 150,000 men, 27,500 animals. That's where we are in 1918. We've got in the Army Service Corps alone very nearly a third of a million men, now feeding worldwide five and a half million men and just short of 90,000 animals. With, that's our number purely on the Western Front. Now, when you start looking at that, you realize that actually the Army Service Corps in August 1918 is three times the size of the entire British Army in 1914. Mm -hmm. That is a massive expansion. Uh, by the way, it is worth saying 
that some Army Service Corps men actually do receive the highest award possible. One of them is an ambulance driver who gets a Victoria Cross in 1918. The other one, and a very typical move, because they are so experienced, they're taken out of the Army Service Corps and they're dropped into infantry battalions as battalion officers. I have no idea what someone in the Gordon Highlanders or the Foot Guards would think of receiving an officer who previously was helping to deliver jam, but there we are. <laughs> and that's our total units. So 1914, motor transport units, 21, horse transport unit, 55, supply units, 50. That's the key thing here. Look at the difference in number between motor transport and horse transport. Then look at the number of motor transport by 1918 compared to horse transport. The number of motor transport units is staggeringly higher than the number then of our motor trans horse transport have actually almost stayed roughly in ratio far lower. And supply units have just gone through the roof. What we've actually got then is a situation where the army is now heavily dependent on motor transport but cannot function without horse transport. Remember what I said, 1941, the Jeep, that is the big change. And it is worth saying that back in 2010, while we were filming the film War Horse, Steven Spielberg sought to impress the Duke of Wellington by saying today we'll have 130 uh, horses and cavalrymen in our film. What do you think of that, Your Grace? And the Duke of Wellington said, the last time I saw a cavalry charge was Syria in 1942. We had eight and a half thousand. Thank you, Stephen. <laughs> um, this then is just some of the things we need to bear, bear in mind. One here, getting horses used to crossing rivers if required. If you look very carefully, they've actually got lines in the water so the horses can't be swept away. This is a, a lovely picture from the uh, records of the Army Service Corps. This one here shows a horse actually about to be pulled over so that they can actually do some veterinary work. And the work of the veterinary corps is very, very good uh, for helping horses to recover. In fact, if you look here, sorry, that one, go back again. We actually have this one being branded. Um, I mean, what could possibly go wrong when you put a red hot iron on a horse's ass? I mean, you know, there he is. But if you look at it, he actually is a qualified shoesmith. And you'll see that nobody's standing behind the horse for obvious reasons. But just out of interest, you will also notice that that's the military tail. So they couldn't be sold, they were branded normally on the hoof with their number. Obviously, that's the broad arrow, the Ordnance Corps, but the tail was cut short because that way nobody could steal a horse without it being absolutely clear in a field that was a, an ex-military horse that had been stolen. And then we've got this. This gives you an idea just of our, our soldiers going on parade. And actually, when it comes to the horses and their tack, no supplies were provided to keep all of this clean and greased and polished. But it had to be. So the men would very often write home saying, can you send emery cloth? Can you send a polish? Can you send... And they would do it. And I remember meeting somebody who was an Army Service Corps driver. They had basically spruced up everything. It looked beautiful, immaculate. Cleaned up horses, everything. And coming the other way was a group of French transport wagons. Everything was rusty, horses were grubby, and both groups of people looked at each other. We sneered at the French, basically lazy French. The French looked at our ones and went, basically, you've spent how long doing that? <laughs> it still works. And our guys kind of went, yeah, it's a bit stupid, isn't it? and just carried on anyway because they wanted to be as smart as possible um this by the way is an example of a veterinary motor ambulance one of the things that actually uh, we had at the rlc museum was a horse-drawn horse ambulance 
Uh, one thing I discovered about it, by the way, is that horses don't mind motor ambulances. They actually hate the motion of being pulled by another horse. Um, so on one occasion, a horse we put in the motor the horse ambulance tried to kick it to bits and was very nearly successful. Um, but there we have our, our horse ambulance. And then this one is then our remounts directorate. During the war, providing and trained 570,000 horses, 131,000 mules. These numbers are staggering. And one of the things that I did on a regular basis while at the um, RLC Museum was receive inquiries from people. And the inquiry almost always said the same thing. My granddad was in the Army Service Corps. Can you tell me where he fought? Thank you for your inquiry. Your granddad was in the Army Service Corps. He didn't fight, he served. Oh, well, oh, it's a shame. Why is it a shame? I thought he might have been in the trenches. Well, if he was in the trenches, he's a one in five chance of dying and you're never born. Don't wish something you don't really want. Basically, without this lot here, we're going nowhere. But I repeatedly met people who said, my granddad got no medals at all in the First World War. What did he do wrong? What did he do? <laughs> oh, he was a remount specialist. He never left the UK. In the Second World War, and you should all remember this, there was a thing called the Defence Medal. Even if you never left the UK, you got a medal. In the First World War, if you did not serve overseas, you didn't get a medal. So you could do five years, basically, remount specialist, supply specialist, whatever it is, if you don't take foot foot in Belgium or Gallipoli or France, you don't get a single medal. And then this then gives you an idea of where we are. Now, during the course of the war, roughly half a million horses are actually sent to the equivalent of a casualty clearing station, of which the vast majority make a full recovery and return to active service. It's about, about 80%. Exactly the same, by the way, as soldiers making a full recovery and returning to active service. And you've got some idea, hospitals, evacuation stations, and mobile sections are capable of going forward. And just out of interest, I thought you might like this. Oops. And this is our horse prices. Now, when it comes to a soldier in the Great War, a soldier in the British Army, in the trenches, or anywhere else, is earning a shilling a day. There are 20 shillings in a pound. So, that is one shilling, that there. That's one shilling there. The fact is that a horse costs in the UK 55 uh, pounds 17 shillings and sixpence in terms of multiples of a pro of a soldier's wages you're looking at the entire war for one horse so at the end of the war when you hear oh well they just killed horses and they basically people ate them they most certainly didn't we were actually buying horses from the US we were buying from South America we were buying then from Portugal, Spain, and some of the prices absolutely astronomical. They really are very, very high. The highest, obviously, being horses from the UK. Um, and actually, what we then get is this, the situation in 1918. This one is the disposal of animals branch of the Royal Army Veterinary Corps, formed in August 1918. Now, hang on. When does the war end, remind me? November. November. So there was a disposal organisation of the Royal Army Veterinary Corps formed at the time of the Battle of Amiens before we'd won the war. Somebody knew something was going on, didn't they? And it may well actually have been the Army Veterinary Corps. And altogether, we actually raised £700,000 from disposal of horses. And basically what happens is the War Office is asked by the Treasury, by the Treasury, how many horses would a post-war army need? The answer was 60,000. The solution was sell the rest where they are. 
Now there are exceptions to that, particularly when it comes to Australians, who, if anything, are a little bit, I think the expression is larrakee. Larrakee means a little bit fly, a little bit criminal. They were told in Egypt that their mounts would be sold to local Egyptians. They had a gymkhana, they had a big horse parade. The following morning, every single man went onto the beach. Every man had his rifle. Every man said goodbye to his horse and shot it through the head because they were not going to let the Egyptians have their horses. That was not happening. That was the, one of the big exceptions. And by the way, some horses were sold for meat or used for meat. They were sick or injured animals and they were only used to feed refugees or German prisoners of war at the end of the war. Basically, what we've got is this. If we start thinking about our army, we're thinking in terms of a massively mechanised army by 1918. AJP Taylor, as I said, writes a book and he says the generals were all stupid. They spent too much time on food for horses. Well, you know why? Because if they don't, we can't do a damn thing. I did some work on Dunkirk, not one of Britain's great moments, but in the period up to Dunkirk, we actually send more petrol by weight than ammunition. It's exactly the same relationship. By the way, it's exactly the same, by the way, in Normandy. Post D-Day, more fuel is sent than ammunition by weight because we can't do anything else. And then we get this. This is our total number of vehicles and everything else. Out mobilization 1914, we have about a thousand lorries, 193 uh, cars, motor ambulances, none. Motorcycles, 116. That's the number on the 11th of November. 55,000 motor lorries, 23,000 uh, uh, motor cars, 7,000 motor ambulances, 34,000 plus motorbikes. These numbers are absolutely staggering in terms of what it was like at the beginning of the war. And very, very importantly, during the course of the war, these are our numbers. Do you remember what we came up with? Here's our ammunition number, basically about 5 million tons of ammunition. Oats and hay, slightly more than 5 million tons. Food for soldiers there, and then that staggering sum of about three quarters of a million tons of petrol and oil, just to supply the army. And what it means is at the end of the war, these two were purchased from a sale of horses. These were meant to go out to basically civilian contractors. They are called Peter and Punch. Peter and Punch were bought by the Army Service Corps Association. Basically, the soldiers all contributed to buy these two. And until they both died in the 1930s, every time there was a parade representing the Army Service Corps, these two turned up to demonstrate what actually horses did in the war. And by the way, they would have received their medals, all horses that came back, received a, a medal from the RSPCA. And one of the really strange things about this is that I ran repeatedly an event called the Horse in War, before I even worked on war horse. And what we did there is we had horses from Roman times right through to the Second World War. And on one occasion, somebody who was a farmer came up to me and said, hmm, funnily enough, my granddad bought a team of Don horses in 1919 from a sale in the UK of horses brought back from the continent. And he said they were brilliant on the farm. That autumn, he went ploughing. And as my granddad got to what's called the headland, there's the hedge, you turn around and come back, the, hedge, the, 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 the headland, he turned the gun horses away with the plough on it, they bolted and damn near killed him. Off they bolted to the middle of the field, he stopped them, calmed them down, went to the next headland, turned them round, they bolted again, very nearly killed him. 
He then went to the barracks and said, excuse me, I bought these lovely, basically, uh, bay horses, they're gun horses. Every time I get to a headland, they gallop. What's wrong? And these are big, heavy horses. And basically, the gunner he met, probably gunner officer, said, well, they'll do that. Why? Well, when you bring a gun into position, what happens is you come in, you turn around, the gun is dropped off, and then the, the, basically the drivers spur the horses away so the enemy can't get you with the team on the battery position. Because if they hit you then, they kill the lot. So they're doing what they were trained to do. What I suggest that you do is that when you get close to a headland, just basically put a bag on their heads. And that's what he did the rest of their lives. I told that story and somebody close to where I lived said, my granddad brought a team of Army Service Corps horses. And they were lovely, brilliant. No problems like that at all. And then in the autumn of 1919, there was a horse fair in a local village. And what he thought he'd do is take them down. So rather than taking a wagon or anything, he was showing the horses off. He just long lined them, yeah? He had them on long line. And they got to a crossroads. And at the crossroads, he was dragged for a quarter of a mile. Got to the horse fair and went, what the hell was that? He was a young man. And they went, ah, oh, yeah. Army service school horses, they'll do that. They'll do what? <laughs> the Germans target crossroads. They will never have been walked through a crossroads at the front in their lives. They are protecting themselves and trying to protect you. What I suggest you do is put a bag on their heads. <laughs> anyway, I then learned how to horse plow, as you do, ahead of war horse. Um, because I thought it would be useful. I'll see about that in a minute. <laughs> I went down to the West Country and I was taught how to plough with horses with a team of Clydesdales. Everything was fine with it. And then Harry Gotts, who ran the corps, said, my granddad was too young to serve in the war, but in 1920 he was given a mule and he worked for the council in Lambeth in London and his job was to empty yeah, rubbish into the River Thames for the correct state of the tide, yeah? and then bring back gravel for improving the roads. And everything went really well. This mule was as good as gold. And so one day, in the middle of the street, it sat down. It just wouldn't move. And a costermonger, basically a, a guy running a stall, came up and said, well, young man, got a problem, haven't you? I have. He said, well, do you want me to get this to stand up? And he went, no. Okay. Cost you a tanner. That's sixpence, by the way. <laughs> Get lost. Anyway, he was there for an hour, and eventually the bloke came back and went, got that sixpence, and he went, yeah. <laughs> and the bloke got a tin box out, and out of it he took a load of straw and some newspaper, stuffed it under the mule's bottom and set fire to it. The mule stood up, and he said, do you know what? From then on, he kept on the, 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 the wagon, yeah, the cart, he got a tin box with a box of matches, yeah, a load of newspaper, load of straw and it worked perfectly until one day he put it under the mule's arse the mule stood up turned around pissed on the fire and sat down again <laughs> <laughs> i'm not certain i believe that <laughs> but of those three stories about horses i i like them all very very much now as you might be aware i then went on to work on the film of war horse we worked very largely actually on the trenches, but I had the opportunity to actually do some of the things we've spoken about. I was for the opening sequence, a recruiting officer for the Army Service Corps, um, because it was a nod to my job. I was able to work alongside one of the Joeys. There were actually were 13 Joeys in the film, although you might be forgiven for believing from all the propaganda or publicity, just the one. This, by the way, is the one that jumped over the tank. Mm -hmm. And unlike Sam Mendes with both the rat and the horses, I'm sorry, and the cows in 1917, this was not CGI'd. Um, it is worth saying, by the way, that we had to then um, have dead horses, but it being a Disney film, there was never any blood. 
And um, one of the most unusual thing that I ever had to deal with was foam rubber horses on the basis that my team of um, uh, uh, basically supporting artists, they used to be called extras, they're now called supporting artists. Mm -hmm. On one occasion I came back at lunchtime in the scene here with the aftermath of the cavalry charge and they'd taken six of the horses, they'd put one in the middle, the other ones round the outside and they were playing cards on it. <laughs> because they could, they were incredibly light. Um, again, when the film came out, I was very, very pleased to be involved. Someone said to me, didn't it worry you as a serious historian? You can tell I'm not. Um, being involved in the film, and I said, I could give a talk like this every day of my life, and I might be able to speak to, what, a few thousand people, you know? Make a film about horses, and eight and a half million people know about something about horses. And if it got them to go, oh, what was the reality? What really happened? Then I've done a really good job. And one of the curiosities about all of this is although I earned quite a lot of money from making this film, I've made more money talking about making the film than I did from making the film. <laughs> I, I worked that out about two and a half years ago, and it's now 10 years since the film came out. My real point for all of you is that decisions about the fate of horses at the end of the war, the army don't care. The army passionately cared about horses and would continue to do so. We still have quite a lot of horses in the British Army to this day, as do you. It was the Treasury who decided to be hard-hearted about it, and the government was happy to sign that off. The fact is, horses were not sold willy-nilly for meat. They didn't go that way. And just to completely ruin the film War Horse or the novel, I was hearing earlier on someone was telling me about bringing back mounts from Europe back to Canada because they belonged to senior officers. That would happen. If you bought a horse in France, God knows why you'd do it, and then turned up at a tar or turned up at um, Calais and said, hello, I've got a horse, can I bring it with me? <laughs> You've got about as much chance of getting it on board, yeah, as you would do getting a camel through the eye of a needle. Because the, the guy in charge of loading the ship is going to say, son, piss off. There's no way it's coming with you. Get rid of it. It would never happen. So although the film, that lovely heartwarming moment when it reappeared back in the Devon countryside with the same horse, it simply would never have happened. It just, it's absolutely impossible. Um, I hope I've given you a bit of a flavour of the Army Service Corps, particularly the work of horses, but also mirroring it with also the level of mechanisation that would then go with it. It is worth saying now that uh, the British Army has a very large number of horses. We operate a troop of Royal Horse Artillery. They use 13 pounder guns. Many of you have seen them doing gun salutes um, in Hyde Park and elsewhere. It is worth saying it's the one unit in the British Army that would not function were it not for women volunteers. Because so few men actually want to do it. And women actually like working with the troop. The troop is the one unit in the British Army that will not survive without lots of women volunteers to keep it going. Uh, and King's Troop, by the way, was chosen by uh, George V to survive the mechanisation of the British Army because he thought we ought to have a representative troop of horses and as you know the Blues and Rolls and the Horse Guards are still doing mounted ceremonials to this day and it, for whatever reason YouTube loved the fact that actually when they are on parade and actually in position they are on active duty and therefore American tourists grabbing the reins goes down really badly. Um, I, I, it's going to seem people, oh you know, how offensive British um, uh, soldiers can be to poor uh, tourists. They are there for a reason, they are not there purely for ceremonial functions. I do hope that when you go from here you've got some idea both of the success of the Royal Army uh, Medical Corps 
and more importantly, the important role of the Army Service Corps. They may have been the Jam Bandits, they may have been Ali Sloper's cavalry, but without them, there is no war. We need them, and today, the Royal Logistic Corps, we need even more. By the way, having worked with the RLC, I am aware that today, they still get smeared. They are known as the really large corps, the recruits last chance, <laughs> or following a gay wedding, the real lesbian corps. <laughs> it's true. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Take a couple of questions. Yes, by all means. Yes. Once again, recruitment. Um, would you get any of the guys who are like, you know, was a category B? Category, you know, the guys that can't march, but are no, no, they, they, they were, they were very well paid. The motor me mechanics, sorry, motor drivers were paid three more, three, three, paid three times as much as infantrymen. Yeah, uh -huh. so you could be on up to four shillings a day. If you're a motor mechanic, you're on six shillings a day. I mean, basically, make that a shilling a multiple of eighty dollars, say a hundred dollars. You know, you're, you're on $800 a day, the equivalent thereof, mm -hmm. if you're a motor mechanic. And when it comes to then, whatever you do, you have a trade test. So when you volunteer for the Army Service Corps, what do you do? I'm a motor mechanic. Okay, there's an engine. Why doesn't it work? I don't know. Infantry. Yeah? <laughs> Here's a horse. It's pulling. What do we do? Don't know. Infantry. You know? <laughs> By the way, in the same way as if you volunteered and said I was a butcher in the Army Service Corps, another trade in the Army Service Corps, um, they would actually give you a joint of meat and say fill it that out. And if you did, you you got basically a trade one a classification. So it, no, it's not. It's it's not a, a a medical downgrading or anything else. It is purely actually on your ability and previous experience. If anybody here ever comes across anybody in the Army Service Corps, and you actually get a prefix in front of the number, yeah, your number four and five seven whatever. If it says T, that means transport. In the terms of 1914 to 18, T means horses, transport. If it says M, that's mechanical, that's either a traction engine or, an electro, or, or, or a petrol engine, that's what it is. Um, if you also then get an S prefix, that means a service specialist, supply specialist, basically yours in terms of regulating what actually goes on, that, that's what they do. Yeah, it's an interesting situation to be in. My wife's grandfather uh, did an apprenticeship at Rolls-Royce and then spent five years driving a lorry. Um, at the end of the war, he got a war gratuity. My grandfather got a war gratuity. His war gratuity was based on his service throughout the war was 48 pounds. To put that in perspective, you could buy a lorry for 10 pounds at the end of the war. He bought three and started a haulage company. My granddad left the army at the end of his two and a half years service, wounded twice, gassed twice. You know, I don't want to rub his nose in it in terms of then George Hawley, uh, but actually he got six quid. You know, he could probably buy a hoop and a stick with that. You know, he was not going to buy a lorry. You know, you've got the idea. So again, it, you, you do get better pay and you do get better conditions. But you have to then demonstrate you can do it and do it adequately for the rest of the war. Mm -hmm. Fine. Good. Good. Fine.